In the last lesson we talked about epistemology in general and now we will apply it. You can apply it to daily thinking. Daily thinking. Suppose you're in the following situation. Somebody's looking for his keys and he tells you my keys are not in my jacket. He assures you his keys are not in his jacket. And you might ask how do you know that your keys are not in your jacket? That's a question on the sources of his knowledge. He might answer, well, yesterday was a warm day and therefore I must not have taken my jacket and therefore my keys cannot be my jacket. Now, if you are an empiricist, you might think that his excessive reasoning might be problematic. And you might urge him, well, just go check it. You know, there, there's just one way really to know, and that is to go and observe. Check out your pockets. If they're not in there, then I believe you. But just reasoning your way through by arguing, you know, yesterday the weather was nice, so I, therefore I have not taken my jacket, therefore the key cannot be my jacket. So these are long chains of reasoning. and. Some people tend to not believe in these long chains of reasoning. They tend to believe their eyes when they see something. These people are empiricists. So now we're applying that stuff to, to some daily thinking, right? And it's useful to do that in general when you're doing philosophy. Try to come up with little examples from daily life and see how that works out. Let, let's have another example. Uh, suppose somebody tells you, all Belgians are stupid. Again, you might ask, how do you know this? And yeah, there the problem is, again, have you observed any stupid Belgians? Moreover, if you have observed stupid Belgians, have you observed enough instances of stupid Belgians to conclude that they are all stupid? So these are all applications of the theory of knowledge, of epistemology. And hopefully epistemology can be useful in that sense. Now, philosophers don't just apply to daily thinking. The most important application of epistemology is on scientific thinking, on scientific knowledge. This is in the branch called philosophy of science. Philosophy of science. Philosophy of science, in a sense, is philosophizing about science, of course, and it's broader than just the epistemology of science. But the main part of philosophy of science is really the theory of scientific knowledge. So then our knower here becomes a scientist. Now he's a scientist. And we ask these questions about our scientist. What is scientific knowledge? Is it possible to acquire scientific knowledge about reality? And what are the sources of scientific knowledge? And science here can mean a bunch of things. I mean, we have uh, physics, we have philosophy of physics, we have philosophy of biology, we have philosophy of economics, Every scientific discipline can be studied by philosophers, and a lot of them are, in fact, studied by philosophers. Traditionally, philosophy of science was mainly philosophy of physics, but now biology and economics are really getting important as well. So, if we apply this stuff to philosophy of science, let's just give a couple of examples. What does it look like? What is it about? Let's take the second question here on the possibility of, um, of knowledge. So I talked about the skeptics who doubted whether we're capable of really grasping what reality is about. On the other hand, you have the non-skeptics who believe that we can make the bridge to reality. Now, in philosophy of science, you have similar questions. Reality, and let's take physics, Reality for scientists looks a little bit different than the reality that we think about in our daily life. The reality of the f uh, um, physicists is, is made of 
particles, microparticles, um, atoms and quarks, etc. And there, philosophers of science wondered whether this is really a an existing entity, whether this is a reality in existing independently from our thinking, or whether this is this is just a construction in our minds, whether we have just invented it. So is it just here? Quarks, let's say quarks. Are quarks just a construction in our mind or is it a reality? And people, philosophers of science who believe that it's a reality are called realists or scientific realists. Realists. And philosophers who believe that it's merely a construction in the mind are called constructivists. Constructivists. There you go. So that's one possible topic. On the sources of knowledge, there, there's also different stuff to be told. I mean, we talked about daily thinking, but um, the question how we acquire knowledge gets a little bit more a little bit more complicated in science because, of course, a scientist spends much more effort in acquiring knowledge. It's his profession. So, a scientist also uses his senses and also uses his reason or his brain or his intellect, but in a very specific way. In his senses, he's not, he's not just going to passively observe what happens in reality, but he will actively intervene in reality and to tinker a little bit, um, you know, change some parameters, pour some liquid over some, some other substance to see what happens. So actually, there's, there's an active component to uh, scientific observation. This ex active component, this is really what we call an experiment. In an experiment, you try to tinker a little bit with the parameters to see what, what comes out of it. So we see observation again in science, but it's a special kind of observation. It's an active observation, if you like, and it's an experimental one. On the other hand, scientists also reason, but again, it's a special kind of reasoning. It's a very disciplined kind of reasoning, a rigorous one, a difficult one, some, some which we aren't used to, and it, it requires many, many years of training to acquire this kind of thinking. And one specific characteristics of scientific reasoning is, of course, the mathematical character of it. They just don't argue freely. There's also logical arguments like, therefore, 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 think about the guy with the keys, blah, 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 therefore, blah, blah, blah. You also got that, but you also have um, mathematical models being constructed. And it's useful to think about the difference between mathematical modeling, which is something scientists often do, and experimenting and observation. So mathematical modeling, it's really something you can do with your eyes closed, right? You don't need your senses to do that. You can be blind and mathematically model in your head and in your office with, with the doors closed and the windows closed. It's perfectly possible. On the other hand, observation, you can try to do it with as few theoretical assumptions as possible, right? Just, just watch. It's very difficult to do that. And this, is, this is a little bit of a specialized topic, so I won't, won't say too much, but I think you're, you're starting to grasp what the difference between reasoning and observing is. Okay, so I think I gave you a little bit of an overview what, of what epistemology is about. Uh, in general, but also apply to daily thinking and philosophy of science. Perhaps a little homework for this lesson could be, well, what is the use of thinking about science? K 
can this really be practical? I, I try to suggest a couple of times that epistemology can be practical, apply to daily things, but also to science. But can it? Isn't it just better to do science rather than to think of it? Homework. <laughs>